We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Great. Welcome everybody to today's session, the Oversight Board One Year On Lessons in Online Content Moderation. Today we'll be discussing digital rights, self-regulation and sharing learnings from the Oversight Board one year since it began reviewing content moderation decisions made by Meta on Facebook and Instagram. The Oversight Board consists of three interlocking elements, the Board, the Trust and the Administration each play a critical role in ensuring the success of the Oversight Board. Today, I'm very pleased to say we have representatives of each joining us on the panel. Thomas Hughes, Director of the Oversight Board Administration, Afia Asari Chai, Oversight Board Member, and Shireen Chalabi, Trustee. My name is Tracy Manners, and I work across global communications and engagement at the administration, and I'll be moderating today's session. Throughout today's session, Audiences are welcome to submit questions, which will be compiled and answered at the end. And our panel will talk us through the origins of the board, the decisions taken so far, and what lies ahead for social media regulation. The first part of our discussion today, will look at the challenges of building the board. And for that, I'll turn to Thomas first. Thomas, firstly, for those who may be less familiar with the board's work, could you summarize its role and its work to date? Tracy, thank you, and, and likewise, uh, it's a pleasure to be here today, and, and thank you for those who are joining us. Um, so the Oversight Board uh, is the first of its kind, uh, an independent self-regulatory model set up by Meta to act as a final check on the content moder moderation decisions that the company takes on uh, Facebook uh, and Instagram, so just those two platforms. Um, users can appeal to the board directly if they believe Meta got their decision wrong in relation to their particular content, or if they see a piece of content that they think should be taken down. Uh, and, and Meta can also refer cases to us or ask for guidance on a, on a particular policy area as well. Um, the board applies a, a global human rights framework to all of its decisions, uh, looking at Meta's community standards and its values that are stated on, on its website. Uh, and seeking to understand how those align with uh, global human rights standards. Uh, we currently have 20 board members who come from quite a diverse range of backgrounds uh, and professions from journalism to politics and academia and, and human rights advocacy. Uh, and our decision makers, and those board members are the decision makers, um, are intentionally uh, global. Um, they, they speak 29 languages approximately and have, have lived in 27 countries uh, between them. Uh, and, and they were all selected because they have a proven track record in advancing freedom of expression and, and other human rights. Um, the board selected its first cases uh, in December last year, almost exactly a year ago today. Uh, and since then, uh, we've accepted 23 cases uh, and issued 17 decisions. Uh, in 12 of those cases, uh, the board has overturned the, the original decision uh, that, that Facebook took. Um, these cases are, are globally diverse, uh, with more than half coming from Latin America and Asia and Africa. Uh, and the board's decisions in upholding or reversing Meta's content decisions are binding uh, on, on Facebook and Instagram. Um, so, they so the decision has to be implemented and, and, in all, and in all decisions, all cases has been implemented. Um, as I mentioned, additionally, the board offers policy guidance uh, that Meta must consider uh, and respond to publicly. And again, the implementation rate is, is well over half, um, with only a very small number having been rejected and, 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 and the rest still under assessment. Um, this means the board's decisions uh, are not limited only to specific pieces of content or specific cases, and um, because a policy recommendation could lead to a, a much broader change in Meta's conduct. Uh, and, and many of these deal with uh, some of the most complicated, complicated questions uh, of content moderation uh, and, and do so hopefully in a, in a transparent manner that allows uh, increased public scrutiny as well. Perfectly summarised. Thank you, Thomas. Um, and just staying with you for a moment. So you joined the board in January 2020, 2020 
before it began receiving cases um, when there were just three co-chairs and am I right in thinking no other staff. Um, so now one year on there are 20 board members around 60 staff and over a million people have submitted appeals to the board. Can you just talk us through how you took the board from a concept to an operation and perhaps, um, you know, give us uh, some insights to what the biggest challenges were in doing that? Uh, certainly, Tracy. So, so when I joined in, in January 2020, yes, they were the co-chairs and, and, and I believe I was um, uh, staff member number one. Uh, and we have since then uh, obviously built out the institution. Uh, it, back in, in January 2020, we, we had a charter uh, and a set of bylaws that were given to us by Meta. Meta had been through uh, quite an extensive exercise in getting feedback and developing those. Um, but, but they were uh, just, just what, what you see online, actually. They were those charter and bylaws and no processes had been put in place to operationalize how to, how to live those uh, and, and how to put them into practice. Uh, we also had a website, uh, but obviously there was there was no content on the website. There were no no colleagues to post content onto the website, uh, and you know we we were working to a timeline of, of having an initial cohort of of the four co-chairs and plus sixteen board members uh, by May twenty twenty. So the, the turnaround time uh, was was very tight, uh, and and in addition, of course, to have the staff and the systems in place to be able to support them, so that they could then start receiving cases by October, which is which is a, you know, I think. Formally, we took the first in early November, but, but basically was the original timeline that we had foreseen. Um, of course, an added complexity is that we had to start all of this from scratch. Uh, everyone was uh, working remotely. Uh, only a couple of months in, all of the additional uh, restrictions that COVID-19 has, has meant for everybody around the world, they, they also kicked in. Um, so so all, of the, all of the staff, all of the people had, had, had not met in person or, or even worked with one another before. So everything was... Uh, it very new and, and needless to say, the timeline was, was very ambitious. Um, but we, we announced those board members uh, in May uh, and we had five months to then uh, work together to define the standards and the various processes that would be applied and to, to build a, a working culture uh, amongst the board members as well. Uh, and there were certainly big challenges uh, and questions uh, to resolve from the outset. Uh, there, there were also sort of constant trade-offs between uh, getting things up and running uh, versus deciding, you know, the, the, as it were, the route that we would, we would be taking. Um, and we also had to uh, access the knowledge and the materials that sit within the company as well, and, and to obtain that in a way that, that safeguarded the, the, the decision review process and the structural independence uh, of, of the oversight board as well. Uh, we also had to build a framework for applying international human rights standards. Um, and also to look at how these could be applied vis-a-vis -vis the community standards. There'd been a lot of theoretical discussion of that, but, but we had to do that in practice and to make sure that actually that actually worked. Uh, and, and to do that, we ran uh, uh, simulations, uh, test cases. So we went through case review, although I should say the board members went through case review processes, including mocking up draft decisions and, and testing the, the different processes and the different technology tools that we had in, in place. So uh, by October, uh, when the board essentially opened to receive appeals, um, there was a kind of a, a collective, I think, um, you know, breath holding moment when we switched the machine on uh, and, and we waited to see what, what, what the machine, as it were, sort of spat out, what, what, what came through. And of course, uh, by the time we selected our first cases in December, we, we had already had you know, 200,000 appeals. Uh, and we can say a little bit more about the number of appeals we now see, um, which, is, which is great that, that users are really engaging uh, with, with us. Um, but that 200,000, those first cases really gave us the assurance that the, 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 you know, the, the systems we had worked, right? People could appeal and, and, uh, and we, could, we could see what was coming through. Um, I, I would say there's, um, there's been many significant things, uh, again, being slightly wary of, of you know, blowing one's own trumpet, but there's been many significant things that we've achieved uh, and that I think we've sort of already accepted uh, as the norms. Uh, we you know, had to decide where our biggest impact uh, could be for users uh, and align that with the interpretation uh, of, of the bylaws and to align that also with the international human rights standards and the board members had to make decisions about which ones to apply and where. Um, and we had to harmonize mindsets and approaches and varying ideas around, uh, around those standards uh, and to work out how all these elements uh, and all the elements of the board that we see represented here today with Afia and Shireen, how, how that all sits together and and, and works together as a, as a cohesive independent entity. Um, so these were, these were significant issues to resolve, but, but, but they contributed to what we, what we see now. And I think we fully understand 
but there is still an enormous amount of work to do. Uh, you know, this is just the tip of the iceberg. We've only just started, but still, I, you know, I think it's a, 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 solid, a solid start. Uh, and I think individually and collectively, we all saw the potential impact uh, that these decisions could have. I mean, all of those who are engaged in it and all of the individuals around the world who've submitted public comments, people who've appealed. Uh, and, and I think that has all been driven and underpinned by a, a deep shared commitment to, to free expression and, and human rights. Thank you, Thomas. Um, I'm going to come to you, Shireen, next, if I may. Um, can you share with us your view on why Meta created the Oversight Board? Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Right. So, first of all, I just have to say I'm delighted to be back at the IGF. Uh, I've been a, a member of the ICANN Board for 20 years, and we participated every year at the IGF, and, and I've been on many, many uh, of those meetings. I'm delighted to be back and I'm sure a lot of my ex-colleagues are here listening or doing some good work somewhere else and I wish them a, a really productive week. So thank you for the question. And the question is why, why did Facebook hand over some of its powers to an independent body? And it's, you know, it's, it's a fascinating question. And really to understand that, there are three things to consider, three aspects. Why did Meta create the Oversight Board? The first is the rise in cyber sovereignty. We all know that policymakers and regulators have and are increasingly looking for ways to address their deep concerns about the impact of social media platform on the safety and health of billions of users around the world. Whilst at the same time, they want to protect the privacy and freedom of expression of those same users. You can see how this is an immensely complex dilemma to solve. Unfortunately, there's no quick or easy fix. On top of that, there are also no proven precedent in regulating successfully a virtual public sphere on such global scale. So that's the first aspect to consider, the rise in cyber sovereignty. The second aspect to consider is the intense criticism, and I say distrust in meta. So the concern I just mentioned have focused primarily on meta as it grew into a powerful and integral part of the social fabric of most societies and countries. Almost every crisis, every headline today, plays out in some way across Meta's services. And the more these services become ubiquitous, the more Meta finds itself at the center of extensive criticism on everything, frankly, from the spread of misinformation, to hate speech, to concerns about the company's power and approach to competition. And in such a climate of criticism, trust in Meta to act in the public interest rather than its own commercial interest is at a low. The third aspect to consider within this political and social context is Meta needed to review, renew and strengthen its legitimacy with its stakeholders and global community of users. And to Mark Zuckerberg and Meta's credit, they recognize that and, and here I'm gonna read verbatim because these are important statements. They recognize that decisions that have enormous consequences for our society, for human rights and freedom of expression should not be made by social media companies acting alone. I'm gonna repeat that, should not be made by social media companies acting alone. Furthermore, they recognized that these companies should not be the final arbiter of what can and cannot be said on their platforms. Users should have a voice and their cases should be heard by an independent appeal body. So the time was right therefore for Meta to act. And this is how the oversight board began. I may say a bold move to create such an independent appeal body in order to strengthen user rights against arbitrary decisions. 
So that's the historical content of why the Oversight Board was created by Meta. Back to you, Tracy. Thank you, sorry. Jeremy. Thank you. Um, Afia, holding Meta to account for decisions on how it manages its platforms is not new to you. Um, but can you tell us what made you decide to join the board and whether your expectations of it have shifted in the last year? Can't hear you at the moment, Afia. Thank you, Tracy. Um, and, and I'm delighted to be here as, as well. Um, the work of the Oversight Board is ultimately about protecting users and making sure that online spaces that they use on Facebook and Instagram are safe and healthy. Um, and Meta has to be held accountable for ensuring this. Now, I have worked for more than um, a decade, a decade and a half actually, to improve citizens' access to justice and democracy. And freedom of expression um, is, is central to these issues. Now in Africa, um, where I come from and I call home, Facebook is the internet. Um, people go there to connect and, and mobilize. They share their views um, in, in ways that they would not be able to do in, in, in other you know, public um, forums. Um, they come together to discuss issues and find solutions. Um, and, 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 and so in, in places where, you know, um, expression of opinion is not a freedom that comes easily, I believe we must fight to protect the, the, the few spaces where it exists. Um, I have spoken out in the past in Africa about the frustration of, of, of Africans um, on, about social media users in, in Africa. Um, we have seen with, with most, um, you know, important decisions time and time again, they are made um, outside. Um, and in this case on content moderation, they are made in, in, in Silicon Valley and then applied in, in Africa with no consideration of our context and how it impacts um, the, the right of freedom of expression of people um, here in, in Africa. And so I took on this role because I wanted to fix this, uh, which I deemed as a problem. Um, and the oversight board is very serious about global decision-making. Um, I wanted um, the region that I call home to have a seat at the decision-making table. I wanted to see other leaders um, from around the world and, and to together address these issues. Um, and for the first time, decisions are being taken by a group of global experts, as, as um, um, Thomas said, and, and Shireen also mentioned, with equal decision-making power and in consideration of, of the implications that it has for the globe. Um, given Facebook's global um, footprint and, and the number of people who rely on the platform in the global south, I think the time was right to redistribute this decision-making power um, for, for, for everybody. And, and when I joined the board, we knew that we wanted to achieve great things, but I didn't expect that we would see this come together so quickly. Um, we are testing decisions and applying global human rights um, standards to make sure that the rules uphold the rights of global users um, and that the rules work and that they are accessible for everybody. Uh, and so I'm very proud to be part of this, um, um, you know, organization, others call it a, you know, a, an experiment um, that is leading this charge. And, and I believe that, you know, we have shown that global decision making, not just Western decision making can make, uh, can, can have a, a regional input, which is, which is very important because ultimately Facebook is, and this is my, my personal belief, I believe that Facebook is a formidable but an imperfect um, platform and that the oversight board can help it, you know, can help maintain it as a viable source of information. Um, and, and, and we can, through our work, reduce the harms and that the users can enjoy the benefits of, 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 of these platforms. Um, and, and in so doing, you know, people can use their right of freedom of expression, even and especially in parts where it is under threat. And, and my commitment, my, 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 my life investment is about rights and justice. And I think this is a right that is worth protecting across the world. And I see the board having a potential to have that impact um, here. Thank you. Thank you, Rafia. And I'll stay with you now as we um, discuss a bit more about the um, outputs of the board for the last year. So that's the, the case decisions that we've taken so far. 
Uh, the board was set up to take some of the most significant and difficult content moderation decisions on Facebook and Instagram and apply a critical review of them. Um, which decisions have stood out most to you over the last year? And what do you think ties them together? Well, the board has received over a million appeals from users across the world. Um, and, and the cases um, we choose are based on three broad you know, criteria. Um, Thomas spoke earlier about some of them. So their importance to public discourse, their potential to impact a high number of users, and whether they raise significant questions on matters, you know, policies on Facebook and Instagram. Um, so if I take the three criteria, first on the, on the importance to public discourse, um, I think, of course, the Trump case, uh, impl uh, you know, amplify the debate on content moderation, taking it to a global stage in a way that we had not foreseen um, or it had not been seen before. But our cases on, on, on misinformation um, related to COVID and the use of, you know, racial slurs also stand out um, to me as examples of, of debates that are incredibly meaningful, powerful, personal and need to be had um, and, and, and also that are meaningful in, 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 in the current context of, 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 of the globe. These are issues that we are talking about in our homes um, at, at the moment, you know, on, on, on misinformation related to COVID-19. We, 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 there was a case um, from France where the board insisted that there must be space for legitimate public um, commentary about the decisions governments take. In, an, in, in a pandemic, you know, there must be a distinction between information which is harmful and must be removed and information which is legitimately in the public discourse. Um, our early findings are that, you know, automated removals may not always identify this, this, this fine nuance. The board also recommended that Facebook consolidate its misinformation policies and, and define the harms that, that it was seeking to avoid by removing some of these um, 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 posts. You know, we have also pushed the company to publish a, a transparency report on how community standards have been enforced during the, the COVID global health crisis, including the, the proportion of, of, of removals that um, are relied entirely on automation, machine decision making, and a breakdown by the source of detection, which, you know, Meta agreed to do. In another case, um, we, we looked at the, at the use of racial slur in, in South Africa. Um, we all know the history of South Africa, and here the board said Meta was right to remove the content because it was raising, even though it was raising very important, you know, social issues about the South African society, the poster, the user, um, racialized um, this very critique by using a slur. In South Africa, this term is very harmful and extremely degrading to the people it targeted. So the use of racial slurs on, on platforms should be taken seriously by META, particularly in, in, in a country such as South Africa that is still dealing and reeling from, from the legacy of apartheid. You know, the board um, urged META to provide more information greater transparency around the company's slur list, uh, including that the, 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 the list is how the list is enforced in, in, in different markets. And, and why, is it, why is it confidential? Why is it that the users are, are not, are, do not know what are the prohibited you know, racial slurs? Um, secondly, among the cases that had you know, potential to impact high numbers of users, this, of course, applies to all cases, but the, the, there are some cases that we had um, decided on as, as, as a board, and one comes to mind, which was the one that dealt with the, with the Sikh farmers' protest in, in India. Um, as an outcome of this case, you know, the board called on Facebook to translate their community standards into Punjabi. Now, that is a language that is spoken by over you know, 100 million people. So as a result of one user appealing their case to the board, now over 100 million Facebook users can read the community standards in their own language in Punjabi. Thirdly, on cases which have um, potential to improve Meta's policies and the right to freedom of expression for users on and off the platform, the Colombian case was, was remarkable. Um, in, in this case, 
the oversight board overturned the mayor's decision to remove a post that was featuring protesters in Colombia criticizing the country's president. And, and, and the case, you know, I said it's remarkable because it highlighted very important issues, including the, the platform, um, you know, social media provides for information sharing about protests in environments where, where outlets for, for political expression are limited. You know, while protesters in the video used a word that is designated as a slur under Facebook's hate speech um, community standards, the company could have and should have applied its newsworthiness allowance because the content had public interest value. It was about protesting, um, citizens protesting about the unhappiness um, of, 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 their, of their president. So these are some of, of, of the of, of examples of cases and the criteria um, that we use in, 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 in the selection of, of the cases. Now, in terms of what ties them together, um, all of our cases, all of them is based on the respect of freedom of expression. And time and time again, in our decisions, we have pushed for greater, greater transparency from Meta on, on, on Facebook. Um, we, we are testing you know, the policies and determining whether they are fit for purpose. Um, whether they, 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 are, they are okay in terms of real life examples. We have looked at, at certain uh, cases and we, 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 are, we, are, we are asking ourselves in terms of context appropriateness, how are these cases um, promoting global human rights? Um, and our recommendations have repeatedly urged Facebook to follow you know, central principles, key principles of transparency, make your rules accessible to your users and, and, and the rules should be in the, in the language that the users understand. Tell people very clearly uh, uh, you know, how you make your decisions and you enforce them. And then where people break the rules, tell them exactly what they've done wrong so that they will not <laughs> repeat it, you know, so that I don't become a repeated offender on, on the platform. So transparency is not just about you know, Meta being more open on its policies. It is also about Meta being more open about who and how um, influences its, its application of policies. And the board's work is, is indicating that we need to ensure there is space to understand how governments, for example, are influencing content moderation, moderation decisions. I'll give you just two examples. In August, as a result of the board's case related to the solitary confinement of the PKK founder, Abdallah Ochalan, Facebook has agreed to publish informal government requests to remove content because governments do request Facebook to remove certain content. And we recommended that users must be informed if their content is removed due to a government request. This for me is huge. And Facebook agreed to do this. In October, Facebook said that it will implement fully our recommendation for an independent entity to conduct an examination into whether it's content moderation in Hebrew and Arabic, including its use of automation has been applied without bias because of what was going on in, in, in the uh, Palestinian occupied th territory and, and Israel. And so I believe that you know, people have a right to know what contents their governments are working hard to, to, to remove. Now, you know, your, 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 the other part of your question is, is also very interesting. Did any of these cases test the, the board? Um, yes. The board accepted the Trump case just weeks after we, did, we, we had announced the first um, set of cases for review. Thomas mentioned that we started reviewing our cases late um, in, in 2020 and in, in, in January uh, 2021, that the Trump case um, came to us. And so I think it's fair to say that it was a challenge for, for, for an institution as new as, as ours. Um, and, 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 the, and the timing was, was certainly a, a, a challenge, but I think it also goes to show, you know, what we are cap capable of in that we were able to hear the case and come up with a decision. So, you know, more generally, I think it was clear to all board members when we, we took on this, this um, undertaking that we would not always agree with specific opinions of some of, 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 
of one another um, or some of each uh, of us, but I know we all recognize the unique insights that and perspective that everybody on the board brings to the table um, to serve a, a global community, which, which is Facebook. So, you know, the fact that many people will disagree often passionately, and it happens even in our own families uh, with one another, um, speaks to, to the diversity of the, the, the board and, and, and the, the, the importance um, of the endeavor that we have undertaken. Thank you so much, Afia. Um, Thomas, in your view as director of the administration, which of the board's cases do you think have been the most consequential, either in terms of their impacts on Meta or because of what users have come to know about Meta's decision-making processes as a result? Uh, thank you, Tracy. Good, good question. Um, I think all cases in a way are born equal, right? So I think Afia has made a very good point, which is that each case that the board has taken, has, they've taken for a very good reason based on criteria that, have, that, that, that they've set, uh, looking for cases that are you know, important and consequential and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and it really means that for whichever the community is, that, that is you know, relating to that case or the individual that's related to that case, that has been extremely important for them as a community. So, so I think each and every case actually has been very uh, impactful in its own right. Uh, and, and I think the other point, uh, and, and Afia I think went through some of the cases uh, that I would also sort of highlight as ones that uh, really demonstrate the kind of impact and the change that's taking place uh, within Meta. Uh, also noting that there is still work, more work to be done. But, it, but if, if I look at your question slightly differently in so far as, uh, you know, how, how, how or which cases have kind of broadened global participation and, and scrutiny in Meta's decisions uh, in a way that I think has really not been seen before and, and which of the cases have really garnered international attention, which is, you know, I, I realize I'm reframing it slightly from, from which, which are consequential necessarily. Um, so I, I think, in, you know, I, I would go to the same example that, that sort of Afia used at the end there. So, you know, obviously in one of the first cases, the, the board reviews, uh, reviewed Meta's decision to suspend, uh, you know, former President Trump uh, from its platforms and and th this was um not only the not only the case the board reviewed which raised significant questions on political speech but also obviously garnered an enormous amount of, of attention uh, and and as with decisions uh, for all of these cases it, it was assessed based on on you know global international human rights standards uh, in a way that considered the the impact policies and decisions have on on communities around the world uh, and in this way it's it's hard to imagine Kind of another entity that, that could have scrutinized this issue through that international lens and really opened it up to to debate uh, and feedback from the public through our public comments uh, process in really in really uh, any any similar way um i think more recently also the, the board has responded to concerns raised by um, for, former facebook employee francis haugen and, and the board will be meeting with francis haugen in the coming weeks uh, on, on meta's cross-check system um, which resulted in the board agreeing to uh, review that particular policy and how it's applied. Uh, and again, public comments to that uh, um, opened last week. Uh, and this process uh, will be uh, done through consultation, which will engage international experts and academics and civil society um, before the board makes a recommendation to Meta on, on how to address the, the concerns that were raised. And these, these processes uh, and ultimately decisions on Meta's policies are are matters of, of global public interest. And the board has moved these decisions and discussions outside of the closed doors of you know, Silicon Valley elite into the global arena and, and allowed everyone um, really to, to engage in those um, in, in a way in which is, which is deliberative and, and to make submissions for, for, for board members and panels to discuss. Uh, I think it's also important at the same time to call out that uh, interest in content moderation obviously naturally arises with, with breaking news. Uh, and the challenge, of course, is that when public interest moves on, uh, the commitments Meta has made, uh, you know, uh, uh, may take some time to come to fruition, especially when they relate to significant changes, as many of them do um, to, to the product, as it were, to the platform itself. Uh, uh, and, and the danger is that those recommendations or Facebook's or Meta's commitments get, get kicked into the long grass and forgotten about. So, so the board is committed to scrutinizing Meta's responses to our recommendations over the medium to long term, 
uh, and, and actually has set up a team uh, dedicated to, to doing this monitoring. Uh, and also the, the board has created a, a new committee, the implementation committee, a, a new committee that's going to be doing that tracking and monitoring process. Um, meanwhile, in our first set of transparency reports, we shared data on the, uh, on the issues users were appealing to us about, uh, where those appeals were coming from, uh, the extent to which uh, methods provided data that we needed, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and we're going to continue to push Meta to increase its transparency and share the data of the research uh, that we have with, with other groups uh, who are also working in this space to, to basically what are a set of common goals of, of really improving the experience of, of users uh, who use Meta's platforms. Thank you, Thomas. And a reminder, um, as you said, our quarterly transparency reports are, are, now, um, are now moving. The next one will be out very soon. Um, I just want to come back to you, Effia, um, and um, just briefly, um, you came to the board from civil society um, with a history of leading on transformational advocacy and social change strategies. I'm, I'm really curious to know um, what impact you think the board will have on the people and communities most affected by some of the challenges you've been looking at on social media over the last year. Thanks, Tracy. Well, the challenges I've seen through my two decades of activism um, in Africa are around the relationships between people, power, and, and, and access, um, and here, access to, to social media. Um, social media has become an essential space for, for citizens to express themselves, you know, which in turn empowers them and allows them to then mobilize around human causes and, and build solidarity. Now, in, in my part of the world, internet shutdowns are, are very um, regular, often, you know, legitimized through some, you know, very sporous uh, claim of national security um, and, 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 and no clear legal basis for why they are shutting down these internet. But often, you know, citizens' voices is, is, is getting louder. That is, you know, that they want, I see it as my responsibility to, pro, to, to protect the space, um, to make sure that it exists. The board currently is, is, is working hard and it's scrutinizing the context of each case to understand whether freedom of expression is already suppressed and how. Um, in this way, you know, we can truly start to understand new ways in, in moderating content um, on global scale. Uh, that are not just copy and pasted from, from one context to another with no consideration of how they can be misused. Through public comments, you know, the board also um, can stand with, with voices of civil society and, 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 and movements and raise the alarm and make the calls for civil society that, that civil society has been making for, for years and, and that, you know, META has to respond to them. This only works um, if, if users appeal to the board and if civil society organizations, academia and other groups provide context through which the public comments um, system. Uh, the, there's a question in, in the chat um, on, on how, how do we get more people engaged. For me, it's naturally important that we increase the number of user appeals from Africa and other um, you know, global south spaces, as well as public comments. Although the, the connections between you know, digital rights and democracy is, is realized by activists in, in Africa, the, the backdrop is that there are many urgent you know, issues vying for attention. Um, or on, on, on the Maslow you know, um, scale of needs, perhaps digital rights and, and questions as, as social media and, and internet access might not be, but it is. There is much power um, in Africa. We saw this when you know, CSOs came together in, in outcry when the Nigerian government suspended Twitter a couple of months ago. Um, and, and when it comes to freedom of expression, the stakes are much higher in, in Africa and in, in, in certain um, geographies in the global South. So this is precisely why I am imploring you know, activists and civil society organizations to appeal to the board, to provide the context that we need to understand the African context, the Asian context, the Latin American experience in a way only people living there can truly understand. Thank you, Rafia. Um, and we will be sharing um, further details of how you can engage with the board before the, the session's over. Um, I'm going to move to Shireen now. Um, Shireen, having heard all of this, 
What can you tell us about the governance structure of the Oversight Board? How does it ensure the independence of the board in its decision making? Thank you, Tracy. Uh, I can see this a similar question came to the chat, which is quite good, and also about how the um, how the oversight board is funded. This, in your opening remark, you mentioned that the and it's important when I answer this that people understand that the the governance model consists of three elements, three interlocking elements that Tracy mentioned. There's the board that makes decisions about cases. There's the administration that supports the board. And then there is a trust uh, that is responsible for governing the totality of the oversight board. Uh, Thomas and Afia have succinctly described how the board works and how it makes decisions. But your question about independence and the question in the chat is in my view critical to the credibility of the board's decisions. And you're not alone in asking this question because since the inception of the board in 2020, there's been a high level of public scrutiny and questions about how the board can be truly independent of its creator. I mean, after all, it's Meta that came up with the idea and it's Meta that has funded it. So to answer this question, you really have to understand that it lies within the trust. The trust is the second interlocking element of this model. And from where I sit, from my vantage point as a trustee, as I mentioned, responsible for the governance of the board, I can see how independence is truly rooted in everything we do. Now, let me explain that. Uh, the trust is basically a shield. Why don't you think of a shield between meta and the board? And remember here, what we're trying to do is protect the board that makes all these decisions from any influence from Meta. So the trust in being the shield protects the independence of the board in three ways. The first way is it protects the independent judgment of the board and the integrity of its decision-making process. How? By keeping Meta at an arm's length from board members, and thus keeping the board members free from Meta's influence. So neither Meta can talk to the board members, nor the board members can talk to Meta when they're deliberating and making decisions about cases. That's the first thing. And the trust ensure that this happens. The second way is it protects the board's operational independence. We want to make sure that the board does not need Meta uh, for any operational needs. And this is where Thomas and his administration team come into play because uh, Thomas has dedicated a team of full-time staff independent of Meta who are totally working 24 seven to assist board members with their research, their case selection preparation and communication of decisions. So we protect their independent judgment, we protect their operational independence and thirdly, we protect their financial independence. The, when, when the oversight board started, um, Meta provided a large sum of money that went into the trust. Uh, in, 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 in trust jargon, uh, Meta is known as the settler and the settler has provided uh, that money. Once the money is provided, the money cannot go back. So that is an important thing to remember that uh, Meta cannot withdraw this money at all. It's done, it's finished. So it's now it's totally under the control of the trust. And we safeguard these financial assets. And through these financial assets, of course, we pay the compensation of the board, we pay all the operational expenses, and we manage the entire budget of the oversight board, of the board itself and its members, so that they don't have to worry about the finances. They don't have to worry about operation. They don't have to worry about influence from Meta in terms of decision making. And you've seen the impact of that by protecting its independence. You've seen from what Afia and Thomas have said that the board is not afraid of calling out Meta when it fails to meet its responsibility. And when you look at the decisions so far, you can see also how the board is now an institution working 
not to uh, just put uh, put down uh, um, um, content or or uh, put it up again. No, it's working in shifting meta from making arbitrary decisions or decisions that might be informed by the company's economic interest towards decisions that promote freedom of expression, that treat all users fairly and that are consistent with the company's standards and values. That is really the true mission of the oversight board is to change the user experience, right? So in summary, this government's model is unique. And think about it like this. It was designed from the outset to ensure that the board is not just credible from the outside, but also solid from the inside. In other words, externally, it is recognized for the quality and timeliness of its decisions, but internally, it has to have a robust structure and checks and balances that protects its independence. I hope I've answered the question about independence. Thank you. Back to you, Tracy. Thank you so much, Shireen. Um, and we're going to move to audience Q&A um, very briefly, but I do have one more question for you, Shireen, before we do. Um, I'd, I'd like to hear from you. Um, uh, you know, we talked about the time prior to the board becoming operational, what it took to set it up right up until um, the case decisions that, that have been published until now. Um, I'd like to just touch upon the future. Um, does the oversight board have longevity? As regulatory proposals advance in the years ahead, where do you see the board fitting in? Thank you. I think this is, this is a complex question to answer. And in order to do it justice, I have to briefly describe how, where does the oversight board sits within the spectrum of regulations? Because that's quite important because it cannot be working in isolation. And this spectrum of regulations vary from country to country, from industry to industry. So I'm ex gonna explain first, where does the oversight board sit and then talk about the future uh, immediately after that. I'm gonna try and be brief. So on one end of the spectrum is self-regulation. And this occurs when private organizations or market-based institutions govern their own action through voluntary agreements. In other words, they self-police, self-regulate by establishing voluntary standards or code of conduct or best practices and by which they agree to abide. I mentioned earlier that I served on the board of ICANN for nine years and I can tell you that its multi-stakeholder model of governance is an excellent example of self-regulation. So that's one end of self-regulation of uh, the spectrum. In the middle of the spectrum <clears throat> is what we call co-regulation, which occurs when an industry and government jointly administer the regulatory process. And this would typically involve <clears throat> government watchdogs that provide oversight of self-regulatory organization and government agencies that enforce penalties for violation of self-regulation. Another example of that would be the NTIA, the National Telecommunication and Information Administration of the United States, that had an oversight role over ICANN for a good part of 20 years. And finally, we go to the far end of the spectrum, which is state regulation, which here involves governments regulating the actions of firms in the private sector. Typically, this would include legislations, executive orders, and top-down rules issued by government. For example, the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, that we all know, is a regulation on data protect protection and privacy in the European Union law. And other notable examples are the uh, UK Online Safety Bill and the EU Digital Service Act, which are new proposals for state regulation. So I'm sure by now that I've explained the spectrum, you have figured out that the oversight board, and in fact, um, Thomas let out the secret earlier on, is a type of self-regulation. But it would be remiss of me, however, not to mention that the oversight board was not designed to solve all the problems of Meta alone, nor to supplant the role of policymakers and regulators. The oversight board, however, 
is an important innovative model of self-regulation. You can see it hasn't been untried before on such a large scale, where one of the largest for-profit corporations in the world has created an independent not-for-profit institutions to make binding decisions by which the for-profit corporation must abide. I hope this is not too complicated. I'm gonna repeat it one more time. One of the largest for-profit corporations in the world has created an independent not-for-profit institution to make binding decisions by which the for-profit corporation must abide. This new model was specifically designed to avoid both the commercial interest of for-profit corporations and the potential abuse of state-based regulation. Institutions such as the Oversight Board are, in my view, necessary. You may ask why? Because we don't want for-profit corporations regulating the global virtual public sphere in their own economic interest. Nor do we want national or regional political interests balkanizing that same sphere. In particular, we do not want less democratic or authoritarian regimes to suppress freedom of expression online. Instead, what we really want, what we really need is disinterested, I repeat the word disinterested regulation of our virtual speech. That means impartial and unbiased regulation. And in this regard, the oversight board is truly impartial, whose impartiality, as I mentioned earlier, is guaranteed by the trust. And as a self-regulatory model, it aligns well with the other more established models, which I just mentioned, and which are being discussed as at this IGF meeting. I'm sure you would agree with me that a one-size-fits-all solution does not exist. And you would also agree that no single government, institution, or actor has all the answers. I therefore see the imperative for a collaborative effort between governance, governments, civil society, and the tech industry to agree on an ecosystem of solutions that are clearly grounded on human rights principles and that we critically need to manage the complex challenges of our borderless digital future. And it is within that context of continuous evolution in technology and regulation that I'm confident the Oversight Board will also evolve over time. Back to you, Tracy. I could um, ask you so many more questions, Shireen, but um, I feel that we should uh, give the floor over now to our audience that have been waiting um, quite patiently. And there's a great question that I'm going to refer to you first, Thomas. Um, the question is, um, is Meta developing these models, models like the Oversight Board, not only for itself, but it, will it also be available for other organizations to share? Um, I think Meta's intention was, to, I mean, and of course, this is a question for Meta, but I think Meta's intention was that uh, when the board was created, that other actors may may also choose to, to utilize the board. But I think the, the board's position on this, the board's intention or the, um, you know, look to the future in regards to this is, is not that the board seeks to become a board for all social media companies, uh, because that would bring back the same challenges of recentralization. Uh, but certainly uh, the board is open and willing to share the knowledge and the experience that it's generated, um, because there are many complex questions that the board has already started to answer, not only in terms of what the processes look like, but also in terms of what the standards are that are trying to be set. So I think, you know, I think certainly, um, as I say, we, we, we would be very open and, and from a personal perspective, I think all you know, platforms, particularly those that are, are on the large or very large side, they, they should be creating, uh, if not entities that look exactly like the oversight board, they should be creating independent self-regulatory structures that, that take these difficult decisions on, on some of the hardest pieces of content. Thank you, Thomas. Um, there was a follow-up question here from Laura, which I, I think that's uh, I think that you've answered. But Laura, do let us know if uh, if there was more that you wanted to know on this. I'm wondering, Thomas, um, then if you might just want to share with us your views on um, what you see the 
priorities for the Oversight Board being in the year ahead? We've spoken, I know I've heard you speak about um, creating new standards, new global standards and content moderation. Um, and I'm just wondering if you might be able to share a few of those insights with the audience here. Well, I think there are a number of priorities for the, for the <laughs> board. And I think some of that has been represented in, in what we've heard today. But, um, you know, the, the board is, is a year old um, by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, that's that's both a, a very young lifespan, but also feels like a very long one at the same time, because there's an enormous, uh, enormous amount of work that still needs to be done. Uh, and there's also, a, as, as Shireen was outlining, a new regulatory space that is starting to be created, uh, one in which probably statutory regulation will exist, uh, co-regulatory structures will be created. And I think there is a strong argument that uh, self-regulation should be uh, should be uh, have a prominent place within that ecosystem at the same time. So priorities for the board are, first of all, con continuing to, to lean into the work that it's doing. Um, Meta has clearly flagged that it, it intends to expand the scope of the board and the work that the board does. So we've got a lot of practical stuff that needs to be done to increase that scope and to start bringing new and different forms of content uh, into play. Uh, the board will also increase in size. Uh, the administration will also increase in size to take on and support those new board members, but to also be able to accommodate some of those uh, new areas of scope. But, but I think, as, as was pointed out by both Afia and Shireen, uh, the board sees itself contributing to this global discussion around standards and what are the correct standards across a myriad of different social issues uh, and, and rights issues. Uh, and the board should not be setting these standards alone, it, it, but the board should, and, and I think seeks to contribute to the wider discourse uh, and, and the variety of actors that are gonna help create that clarity. And, and my own analogy in this is that, um, and particularly with, with, with my own um, background in, in human rights work, is that a lot of the discussion around these standards and how they should be applied has been very, very theoretical over the last decade, but we've moved very quickly into the practical insofar as we are, there is a mosaic in front of us and the board is putting together all these pieces and creating clarity around what these standards begin to look like and what the correct application is and where the line should be drawn. And at the same time, that's kind of converging with this regulatory drive and thrusts. So we're seeing all of these things really sort of starting to build and I think that will continue into 2022 and to be to be candid, 2023, 2024 and onwards, because these are these are difficult problems and they're not going to be solved in January or February or March next year. They, they need long term solutions. Um, so so uh, it, the, I guess the, the answer to the question, Tracy, is a, a little bit and an awful lot of everything really is, is what's required in 2022. Thank you, um, Thomas and Shireen. Um, I know that you had some thoughts on another question in the chat. Please do jump right in. But maybe the, the auditor was oh. Indeed, uh -huh. indeed, yeah. indeed. I, I want to uh, answer Alejandro's question. And hello, Alejandro, how are you? We worked together for a long time, so uh, I, I, know, uh, I know how much he, he uh, he really believes in multi-stakeholder models and self-regulatory models. So, so the question, one of your question is, would it be a good idea to get together with other, I suppose you mentioned other platforms, right? And um, well, I think, you see, I think this is, this is a, a thought that um, we have to contemplate at one point in time. Because I think the, uh, what, what Facebook has done here, or Meta has done, is spent quite a lot of money in establishing this. And as Thomas and Afia mentioned, in the first year, we've learned a lot, okay? I mean, we've only been a one year long, so this is gonna progress and our experience is going to, is going to, um, is going to evolve and develop. It would be a pity it would be a pity if everything we know just is not shared with other platforms. Whether other platforms at one stage adopt a similar model or, or this becomes an industry utility, I can't tell you at this stage because it's only year one, as you can imagine. But I think one ought to, at one point in time, one ought to think how this, is, how this could develop and how could the rest of the industry benefit from that because if they do then i think we'll all be better off definitely 100 percent. the other question you ask is about could the multi-stakeholder model of 
something I, I can apply to this. I think it can, I think it can. Why? Because the oversight board cannot work in isolation, right? We have to work with governments. We have to work with social, with civil societies. We, <coughs> we have to work across all regions of the world and take diversity and people's view into account. We have to work with tech industry. So it is inevitable. It is inevitable that comes a point where the, uh, the collaboration of all of this, almost the same type of players that make up the multi-stakeholder model of ICANN will have to be come into play in the evolution of this oversight model. Because if we don't, and if we stay isolated in our corner, we will be passé after a while, right? We have to be constantly evolving, constantly changing, constantly reaching out and constantly engaging with all stakeholders uh, around the world. No doubt about that. I don't know, Alejandro, did I answer your question or you, there was something else I didn't answer? Thank you, Shereen. That has been very clear. Can you hear me well? We can hear you, Alejandro. That has been very clear. And yeah, my point, let's say my, my larger point is do this before governments or international, inter, multilateral uh, intergovernmental organizations decide to create something that's on top of that. Show action, be solving problems. And politically, you don't want maybe to commit government participants inside the board. That creates a lot of legal issues for the government people themselves yeah. who learn in ICANN. They actually don't want to vote because they have to become liable. I mean, they will inherit the liability, all the legal liabilities, all the litigation. Yeah. But uh, get people who are voices that uh, are sensitive to, to, to what governments want so that you have the political connection. It uh, takes a lot of uh, political finesse. Thank you for, for taking this up. Uh, and just to, uh, for the industry. just to add something uh, to you so that you know, when uh, Meta, develops policies for for its content it doesn't do it in isolation it has a public comment period the same way as i can do this and it goes around the world listening to the various stakeholders who then provides input into the policy making you know a bottom up approach in the same way as not exactly the same but you know and not as extensive as i can would do it but nevertheless it's definitely going in the right direction Thank you, and uh, your point is noted, uh, Alejandro. Thank you. Excuse me, uh, please. Is it possible to give floor to the people present in in the forum? Of course, go right ahead. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Andrew Sherbovich. I'm from McGill University in Canada. Uh, so uh, I'd like to ask a, a question that surprised me a lot because of joining the project together with the Facebook Canada. Uh, I looked at the, let, let's say, jurisprudence of the oversight board, and I heard, uh, and I found that there is only 18 cases uh, that is published uh, uh, for, I think, a year of existence of the of the board. Uh, uh, and uh, that surprised me a lot why is, uh, the number is uh, so small actually for that. And uh, the second question, uh, do we need any external rules in your opinion uh, of content moderation on which every, uh, everybody, for example, will agree around the planet? Uh, on which uh, this content moderation will be uh, uh, ex uh, will be operated in ex in accordance with human rights of all other people, or there should be uh, rules uh, dependent on each platform or each moderator. Thank you very much. Uh, may I also add uh, one more question because it quite related uh, to what has been raised. Uh, my name is Xian Hong from UNESCO. Thank you for giving such a fantastic uh, sharing of the oversight board. We have recently launched a report on promoting transparency and accountability of internet companies, particularly related to the content moderation. So it's, that's why we really follow very closely about the results from this oversight 
Oversight uh, Board as um, as an initiative of self-regulation. What strikes me uh, a lot is that uh, it is among 200,000 appeals that um, uh, the board has accepted 23 cases. So uh, what are the criteria for the board to take in the cases? Because I imagine there can be so many factors to juggle in terms of the, uh, the actors, themes, countries, so whatever. So I'd like to have a, a whole picture. So what are those cases? What fits to be considered by the board? And then next to this is a I'm going to have to stop you there. I'm so sorry, but we'll have to cap that question if that's if that's OK with you. And um, uh, we can always pick up. I'd be delighted to pick up with you separately and continue this conversation further. I'm just conscious that we're losing some of our, our panellists here. So I got the last part of your question. Um, so um, it, you mentioned 200,000 appeals and actually it's a million now. Um, okay. 200,000 was in our last um, transparency report, um, which looked at the first uh, quarters of our work, but um, we've just surpassed a million. So, so you're right to point out how many it is. Um, I think just in terms of the selection criteria, it, it also relates to the question um, the gentleman in the room with you earlier was, uh, was asking around, around how many cases we've taken and why. And for that, I think maybe, Afia, you might want to speak to um, why the board, um, uh, how the board selects the cases. You're part of the um, uh, group who select the cases as they go through um, and, and how you're deciding which ones to take um, and what they uh, what they should represent. Um, and then I, I might just ask you, Shireen, just to give a final thought just on um, the earlier part of uh, uh, the question that we just heard, which was around um, shared global rules and how that system, um, how and whether that system should happen. So I'll start with you first, Afia, and then come to you, Shireen. Um, Tracy, thank you, and thank you for the question. Um, I actually spoke about this earlier on, um, on, on the, the criteria that is used to, to decide on or to choose uh, cases, which was the first being the importance to public discourse, the second being you know, the potential to impact a higher number of, of users, and the third being you know, whether or not the case raises you know, significant questions on, on Meta's policies and and, and on Facebook and Instagram. So those three are guiding um, um, principles for us in, in choosing cases. Uh, thank you. So my last question is that, so how we handle with those massive number of million uh, appeals, uh, how, what, what, what will board do more to, to figure out uh, maybe another solution? Because the capacity to handle million level cases can sound uh, mission impossible. Thank you. Did you want to respond further on that, Afia? We really are over time, so I'd have to ask you to keep it um, to keep it very short. But um, perhaps maybe I could just um, say before we pick up this conversation separately, um, it was never intended for the board to receive to um, take on all of the appeals that we receive. Um, we there are no entities. <laughs> Um, uh, that are going to be able to do that. And I think we would be setting ourselves up uh, very clearly for a fail if we if we tried to. What we hope is that as we iterate our process and as we, um, you know, now that we're up and running, um, that we take a holistic approach to understanding the nature of the appeals that we receive. So that's everything from, you know, we do track the um, types of appeals that come in, where they come from, um, which community standards they're um, related to. And of course, we have a, a close eye on how these are playing out in the external world. I think where we can be helped by organisations and other actors is for... Um, uh, you know, constant dialogue and feedback on either through the public comments, through the appeals themselves, or directly with the engagement team on the kind of issues that they're seeing that matter in communities globally, so that we can, um, you know, have that in mind as we're making those selections. Uh, we certainly um, hope that we'll be able to identify trends as we move forwards, um, and that the case, the cases that we select and that the decisions that we take will eventually start to reflect those. So I hope that gives you some answer as a, for an interim. Um, I may just ask you, um, Shireen, if you had any final comment, and then I, I really must close the session.
Uh, I can't hear you, Shireen. Would you like me to answer the question about the rules that was mentioned earlier? I think if you yeah? could, um, yes, if you I could, could and for I'll, a moment, I'll, that would be great. I'll, and I'll do it quickly, yes. Thank you. So the question, if I understood it, right, uh, external rules, I suppose, set by one government, uh, could it apply uh, for content model, could it apply on a global basis? And is this a good idea or a bad idea? Um, I hope that's my understanding of this. But first of all, I have to say that um, trying to get rules that apply on a global basis is, is very, very difficult to achieve. And the reason that means that a lot of governments across the world have to get together to agree on those rules. And governments do not always see eye to eye, even though the overall objective is to prevent harm and protect freedom of expression. But what could be a good regulation in one country could unfortunately open the door for less democratic or authoritarian regime to suppress freedom of expression online in another country by interpreting these rules in a way that is not in the best interest of its people. That is very unfortunate. That's, number, that, that's, that's an issue to consider. The second issue to consider is that rules are set up really um, on the basis of predictable harm, right? You have to predict what harm and create rules that, that, um, that protects against that predictable harm. But what the internet has taught us is that you can't predict all harms. And therefore, there has to be another way more agile than just governmental regulation, which takes time and years to, to be established in order to identify those issues, respond to them and deal with them. So uh, not only that, um, the word context is very important. Rules and algorithm um, don't always necessarily uh, understand the context in which certain uh, content is being displayed. And one of the advantage of something like the oversight board is oversight board, human beings are reviewing cases, right? And they are able to assess the context, in my view, better than, than technology or algorithm can do. So the answer to you is that there isn't a one size fit all solution. There has to be, in my view, a, a combination of governments, rules and regulation that apply to predictable harm and that is applied uniformly, hopefully across the world if we can. There has to be also an element of self-regulation to deal with unpredictable things uh, that needs agility and needs response very quickly. And at the end of the day, the global coordination between governments and civil society and the tech companies is essential to make this a long-term sustainable um, system to protect users around the world. Thank you so much, Shireen. And thank, thank you, you to everybody for joining us. That's all we have time for today. Um, it's, been, it's been an absolute pleasure and our contact details are in the chat. So we, we very much look forward to continuing the dialogue with you beyond uh, today's session. Um, enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of your sessions and good night, good afternoon, wherever you are.